Okay, welcome. We're going to do here three videos, short videos on aspects of financial economics. Many of you will have been studying the financial sector as part of your A-level economics. And what we're going to try and do here is bring together three aspects of regulation of the financial system, in particular to promote financial stability or reduce financial instability. So this is the first video of three and they're clustered together on the YouTube side. In this webinar, we're going to be looking at why maintaining financial stability has become increasingly important for UK policymakers, particularly in the aftermath of the Great Recession that followed the global financial crisis. Crucially, financial instability brings both economic and social costs, and the legacy of a financial crisis can take many years to fully work through. Here is a quick summary for you, first of all, of what each of the major exam boards require students to have covered for their final papers. Take a moment by pressing the pause button if you want to make sure that you know what each exam board requires you to have studied. And here are four key institutions that you'll need to be aware of. Uh, the FPC, the Financial Policy Committee, that their main role is to identify, monitor and take action to cut or remove systemic risks that threaten the financial system as a whole. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. The PRA, the Prudential Regulation Authority, has a particular focus on solvency of particular specific financial markets. For example, the buy-to-let mortgage market, the solvency of insurance companies or credit unions, other specialist lenders in the system. The FCA has a wider remit. It's a has a number of objectives. First of all, to protect consumers. For example, the banning, the mis-selling of PPI insurance or charging, putting a cap on the interest rate charged by payday loans companies such as Wonga. Their wider aim is to protect and enhance the integrity of the financial system, including the people who work in that sector. And crucially, they also try to promote effective competition, especially in commercial banking. And that links to the Competition and Marks Authority, the CMA. Well, their remit is to investigate mergers and takeovers, to do investigations of allegations of anti-competitive behaviour, not just in the financial system, but across the whole economy. Make sure that you have a, a brief, brief, detailed understanding of what the four main organisations are. The main aim of financial stability policy is really to overcome some of the consequences of market failure. There could be one or more types of market failure. The Excel board require you to understand five of them. So financial stability at heart tries to protect consumers, for example, against the consequences of monopoly power or um, the consequences of mis-selling of complex financial products because of asymmetric information. There's a wider aim of financial stability, and that is to encourage confidence and trust in the economy and the financial sector in particular. And one of the big issues here is try to reduce what's called systemic risk. Systemic risk, which we'll look at in a bit more detail in a second. Here is a brilliant quote from a recent speech by a member of the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England, arguing that the private sector, left to its own devices, in other words unregulated, will never fully price the consequences of its actions. In other words, the externalities, we've covered that topic, externalities in financial markets seem large, especially the contagion effects or the domino effects. For example, when there's a loss of trust and confidence between lenders, between banks, and also between savers and banks. Uh, crucially, externalities damage innocent third parties. Lost jobs, lost incomes, when the financial sector comes up against a a major crisis. And the key thing here is just to be aware of the economic and the social consequences of periods of financial instability. So when the system comes under great stress, taxpayers often lose out, especially if the government has to bail out failing or loss-making institutions. De depositors risk losing their savings, potentially. That can be a major cost. Creditors may lose out because of unpaid debts. Shareholders may suffer. The value of share, stocks and shares in, in banks and other lenders may disappear. Of course, there's the risk of, of lost jobs. And crucially, of course, the government has to pay out more in welfare and doesn't get as much back in tax. So the fiscal position 
of the government can also worsen as a result of financial instability. And 10 years after the Great Recession, real GDP in the United States and the UK it remains still well below where it could have been had growth followed the pre-crisis trend. So the red line in each of these charts shows GDP in the years after the start of the Great Depression. The green line, the GDP post-2007 for the USA and the UK. And the green dotted line here shows the, the trend growth of output had growth continued at pre-crisis levels. Which is unlikely, but it does show there's a big gap between where output is now and where it might have been had the financial crisis not happened. Financial crises do have real and lasting consequences, both economic and political. Bank of England estimates that the global financial crisis of 10 years ago and the recession that followed it have left, has left everyone in the UK around £20,000 worse off than had the crisis not materialised. Professor Joseph Stiglitz has been a prominent critic of the financial sector and in particular he's taken aim at the efficient markets hypothesis developed by Eugene Farmer and others. 2008 financial crisis showed that markets on their own were neither efficient nor stable. Slight imperfections in markets <coughs> have large consequences i.e. financial instability creates negative externalities. Worth quoting Stiglitz on financial instability. The purpose of financial stability policies, which we're going to cover in the third video of this series of three, is essentially to try to mitigate what are called tail end risks. Think of your regular daily, weekly, monthly weather, seasonal weather patterns. You know, it's pretty obvious what the weather is going to be most of the time within a range of probability. But of course we do and we do get extreme weather events that lie outside the normal forecasting horizon. The same is true with financial markets. There can be significant, hugely uh, un unlikely, but massively important events and shocks. The global the subprime crisis was a good example of that. These are so-called black swan events, and they lie at the tail of the probability distribution. According to this brilliant quote from John Cunliffe, Bank of England uh, Deputy Governor for Financial Stability, a speech he made in early February 2018, financial stability is now in the UK about the tail of the probability distribution rather than the central probability. It's about what could happen rather than what is likely to happen. So the crucial point is whether the financial system has the resilience, has the buffer, has the stability to be able to weather some big, big shocks. We're going to talk about those in our third video. Crucial to the whole story, and this is a concept I really wanted to take away from this particular video, is the idea of what's called systemic risk. Systemic risk, or system-wide risk if you want, is the possibility that an event at the micro level, for example an individual bank going bust, could trigger instability or collapse on a much wider scale. So we know that the subprime crisis in the United States was of course the catalyst for the global financial crisis. Since the crisis, regulators have tried to make commercial banks and other financial organisations less exposed to shocks. In a sense, they try to create a firewall to prevent the risk of major damage from systemic risk. Banks have to take risk and commercial banks take risks that sometimes go wrong and they'll make losses but you have to make sure that when banks make losses they can absorb them without just falling over and creating a, a big domino effect. That is systemic risk. Okay that's the end of the first video. In our second video we're going to take a look specifically at the UK and think about are there significant risks to the financial stability of the UK as we go through 2018.